And in 2016, I took on this new role as innovation editor because I thought we needed at the FT to write more about technology and in particular the kind of interface between technology and economy, finance, business and society and culture. Uh, I thought that technology was revolutionising so many different aspects of our lives and we weren't focusing enough on it and writing enough about it. This is The Talent Show, a new podcast series from FT Talent, a hub of innovation from the Financial Times. It's hosted by under 30s for the under 30s around the world. This second series is about all the aspects the FT organization is covering today, from editorial to development, from data to talent. I am Virginia Stagni, and this is a guide we designed to inspire you to be the one driving innovation and change. Welcome to the show. I'm here in the podcast studio with John Thornhill, that is the innovation editor and tech columnist here at the Financial Times. He's also the host of Tectonic Podcast. Check it out. We're going to put it on the show notes. And the founder of Sifted here at the Financial Times and FT Forums. How are you, John? I'm very good. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Um, John, it's kind of obvious from all uh, the different uh, job titles and the roles that you have uh, here at the Financial Times uh, that you have a very, very busy working life. Can you tell us a bit more about your career path? Sure. Well, I joined the FT as a graduate trainee a very long time ago, I think about 34 years ago, in fact. Um, and Uh, I had uh, studied history and, in fact, learned Russian and uh, studied Soviet politics and economics at the London School of Economics. Um, and I wanted to be a Moscow correspondent. It was really my kind of um, big career goal. I had met uh, at the LSE a guy called Mark Franklin, who was then the Observer correspondent uh, in Moscow. It was the time of Mikhail Gorbachev, the whole perestroika glasnost movement, the dying days, as it turned out, of the Soviet Union. And uh, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go and report on it. So uh, I joined the FT and one of the first things I was doing was writing on the UK company's desk. So I was writing about these really exciting companies um, producing building materials or uh, building houses or running garages, uh, which is not exactly what I wanted to do. But I did learn very early on uh, about financial journalism and how you write about corporates and how the market economy works and how bond markets work. And that was actually incredibly valuable when I did go to Moscow in 1994. That was the time the kind of recreation of a market economy in Russia. Uh, and so it was enormously useful to understand how a market economy worked in principle in the West uh, so that you could see how it was evolving in a very different way in Russia in the 1990s. And then what happened next? What has been uh, your uh, next uh, milestone uh, after that Moscow adventure? So I spent six years in Moscow and I was very exhausted by the end. Um, I came back to London. Uh, I was, in fact, uh, then became Asia editor uh, for a few years. Um, and this was before we had an Asia edition. I was based in London, but helping to coordinate our coverage of Asia. So traveled a huge amount around the region, which was incredibly interesting, going to kind of China and India and Japan and all the other countries in Asia. Um, I was then foreign news editor um, during the time of the Iraq war, um, which was uh, quite a trying experience. Um, but incredibly uh, thrilling to be at the center of such a kind of big global story. I then went to Paris uh, to be our Paris bureau chief. I became the European edition editor. I came back to London as news editor, uh, and then I became deputy editor. And then in 2016, I took on this new role as innovation editor because I thought we needed at the FT to write more about technology, and in particular, the kind of interface between technology and economy, finance, business, and society, and culture. Uh, I thought that technology was revolutionizing so many different aspects of our lives and we weren't focusing enough on it and writing enough about it. Everybody is talking about artificial intelligence, journalism, the impact of the chat GPT on everything we are doing. I cannot not ask you your perspective and uh, are you a bit, a bit more on the optimistic side? Is it more helping the efficiency of uh, your job or you see more of the risks? Well, I think the honest answer is that no one knows how this is going to play out. 
Uh, I think there are kind of two arguments you can make. One is, I think, a very kind of pessimistic argument, and another is a pe optimistic argument. Um, I tend towards the optimistic school, but let me start with the pessimistic, which is that this is going to completely change the information ecosystem, um, the ability for us to um, use generative AI to create incredibly plausible content at massive scale and lightning speed is just going to change the whole way uh, that we interact with information. Um, and Daniel Dennett, the philosopher, has written a very interesting article about this, talking about how we now have the ability to create counterfeit people, as he calls them, or kind of deep fakes. Um, and that is going to change the whole dynamics of how we interrelate to everyone else online in the digital world. Uh, and we've got to figure out how we're going to uh, deal with that. The optimistic case is that I think in that process, uh, that actually validates uh, and probably increases the monetary value of verified information. Um, and that, it seems to me, is going to be a good thing overall for journalism. We can ourselves use generative AI to enrich um, and enhance the journalism that we're creating. Uh, we are already using it at the FT to analyze data sets, um, to, particularly in the kind of visual um, storytelling. Uh, we can search um, in much more interesting ways. We can surface information in different ways. And it's an incredibly powerful tool that we can use to enhance all of the, the kind of valid core of journalism that we still believe in at the FT. Have you seen any similar disruption before in journalism that can be compared to the one that we are facing today, or this is something completely revolutionary? I think um, I'm pro I am old enough uh, to remember the days when the internet came in, which might be more difficult for you to remember. Uh, but I, I was actually in Moscow when I first read about this thing called the kind of World Wide Web. And you know, at that time in Moscow, we had telex machines in the office. We would had fax machines. Um, uh, you know, we still had copy takers in London who you would have to phone up when you were traveling around Russia and dictate your stories to them. Well, that was just unimaginable uh, today. Uh, and so the whole concept of the internet um, completely revolutionized media, um, created kind of digital online editions, um, undermined the whole market um, economics of uh, newspapers, and particularly in the US with kind of city monopoly newspapers. Um, but it was also a fantastic opportunity to create new forms of journalism, kind of audio journalism, as we're doing today, and video journalism. Um, and so the FT has kind of massively broadened uh, the spectrum of what it writes about and how it presents all the information that it produces. Um, I think that uh, the artificial intelligence revolution is going to be comparable to that, uh, but it's an, almost an amplification of the internet economy. It's not something that's going to be totally different from that, I think. Do you think that journalism has a role when it comes to education in terms of like um, making good people aware of the risks? Uh, or is it something that maybe public society should uh, uh, be working on? I'm thinking about school, especially primary schools and so on. Sure. I, well, I think both. Uh, you know, I mean, I think journalism certainly should be writing about this and trying to explain what is happening on what is happening, how the world is changing um, and you know, where people can go to find kind of verifiable information. Um, but, you know, it, it is a, uh, a whole kind of societal challenge, I think. Um, how do we raise citizens in this world uh, to understand, analyze, uh, use information in um, responsible ways? Um, and so, yeah, I think that everyone in society has a role to play. How we adapted so quickly as a human to this new habit and now we cannot live without it. It's at the same time uh, interesting because it's in the nature of uh, human beings to be adaptable, to survive. But at the same time, it's a bit, I don't know, it's freaking me out that, you know, we can change uh, so much and so easily. But what is fascinating to me, at least, is that there's, I think, a kind of real generational change. Um, so I'm of the school of journalists uh, to believe in sequential computation, as it were. I you know, have a weekly deadline for my column. Uh, I th think about what I'm going to write over the weekend. I then research it uh, during the week, and then I will file my column to a deadline. Uh, or the younger journalists at the FT and at Sifted, um, you know, where we're writing about European startups who tend to be um, you know, uh, median ages, probably about 30, work in a completely different way to that. They, I would say that, that rather than kind of sequential computation, it's parallel processing. They are doing everything at the same time, which is an extraordinary skill, which um, I hugely admire. 
Uh, and they are going out to an event. Um, they will see some striking visual image. They'll put that on Instagram. Uh, they'll tweet about a comment that they heard. They will have a conversation with someone and think about how can I write a, a blog post about that or what is the story that I'm going to pursue on that. Um, what is a LinkedIn um, post? That I'm, it's constantly thinking how you are going to use material in all the different outlets rather than just writing for a 750-word slot in a newspaper. Johnny, you created with your team a startup within the Financial Times that is sifted. How easy was it to create another um, another entity within the FT? Well, the goal of it really was to create a product that I wanted to read. Um, I found that when I was traveling around the world writing about technology, I was fascinated by what was going on in our backyard in Europe, uh, that you know, right across Europe, pretty much every city you go to, you can find incredibly inspiring entrepreneurs, founding companies, building new businesses. And no one, it seemed to me, in the media world was really capturing that and writing about um, uh, these people. Um, at the FT, understandably, um, you know, we write about the commanding heights of the economy. We tend to write about the p big publicly listed companies. And why write about smaller European companies when we could write about uh, American or Chinese startups who probably globally are more significant? Um, but I still thought there was a gap in the market. And could we create a vehicle uh, to write about this? So the FT um, gave me its blessing, and we have a license agreement um, to use the FT brand name. But we set Sift it up as a totally standalone company, uh, which is quite frightening at times because you have to raise the money or generate the money in order to survive. And if you don't, you're dead. Um, uh, so we are backed by the FT. But as the FT says, we're not backstopped by the FT. Um, and so that is an incredibly harsh discipline that you have to create a product that is going to work in the market within a relatively short space of time or it's, you're not going to continue in business. But that also leads to enormous kind of focus and clarity on what we're doing. Um, and, you know, I'm incredibly proud of what the team have produced over the past four years. Uh, we launched in 2019 with um, kind of newsletters and then built up a site. Uh, we now have 120,000 or so newsletter subscribers. We've had more than 17 million unique uh, readers uh, since we launched. Um, and I think we have become a, a real thing in European startup world. We have become a reference point. And I think we always wanted to become the voice of the European startup community. And I think we have become that. Uh, people come to us, uh, use us as a platform for um, kind of expressing what they want to say about European startups. You also have, I think, um, if I need to think about your career journey and everything that you have covered, I I imagine that we can stay here hours to 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 really like listen to the most amazing stories that you have covered. But maybe if you had to pick one, the most exciting or different thing that you reported on, what would you mention? The most exciting trip that I went on when I was in Moscow. Uh, was I went to Baikonur, uh, which is technically in Kazakhstan, but is uh, still part of uh, Russian territory, which was the Cosmodrome, uh, where Yuri Gagarin blasted off into space. And I went there to see a satellite uh, being launched on a Soyuz rocket. Uh, and it's still a very closed community, um, obviously a very secretive community. Uh, but to stand on the launch pad where you, Yuri Gagarin had blasted off into space was an extraordinary thing. And I remember that they have a museum there, uh, which was not a very kind of auspicious museum. It was more like a kind of tin shed. Um, and you walked into this museum and they had all the extraordinarily kind of rudimentary equipment um, that they had back in the early pioneering days of the Soviet space program. And they had one panel um, uh, which they had used, uh, looked like the kind of uh, inside of a, a larder car, uh, where they had a, a switch that looked a bit like a kind of a windscreen wiper switch in a kind of 1950s car. And that was the switch that they had flicked to launch Gagarin into space. I thought that was quite a cool thing. But I, I have one question. How did you manage to get there? Like, was it like, tell us a bit behind the scenes. Well, it was because there was a Western uh, satellite company, Inmarsat, who had uh, bought space on top of a Soyuz rocket. Um, and so I went there because uh, I was writing about Inmarsat and the launch of the uh, of the um, sat of the rocket. Uh, but also I used it as an opportunity to write about the kind of um, Russian space industry and how it was adapting to the kind of post-Soviet world. 
do you normally like, let's say, you know there is something very interesting happening. Let's imagine that maybe is not publicly uh, shared. And um, back in the days and even today, like, do you um, try to write to the organization to get invited? Or uh, back in the days, did you have your editor write a letter for you? How did it work? Uh, in that case, uh, when I was in Moscow, I mean, it would be entirely dependent on uh, the kind of context that you made and the opportunities that you seized. Um, you know, I mean, occasionally the, you, you would get an instruction from an editor in London to go and cover an oil spill um, uh, or whatever. But it was very much dependent on uh, you choosing which stories to write. Um, and clearly there were many things that you wanted to write about which you were never able to uh, because you weren't allowed to go there or uh, it was just impossible to do so. Um, but you had to try to figure out a way to do so. I mean, obviously Baikonur was a very kind of closed, secretive place, but it was possible to go there on the back of uh, a trip uh, with Inmarsat. Are you ever afraid of uh, forgetting all these amazing stories? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, I like to live in the moment as much as that is possible. So, no. If you had to walk a younger, I want to be a journalist, that is uh, the main part of our audience, through your process of writing such a story, maybe back then, how did you do it? What was the process? Like, did you take notes uh, when you were interviewing people? Did you have the chance to get uh, like a recorder on, on a film or not? And um, how do you do it differently today? Huh. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think the, the basis of any good journalism is curiosity. You just have to be interested in people uh, and how they live and what they say and what they think and why they think it. Um, build up um, relationships with people and understand and listen to what they're saying um, and ask them to introduce you to other people so that you just build up um, uh, a kind of understanding of what's going on and report. Um, uh, how I would do it differently today, uh, well, uh, clearly that was... You went there uh, in those days with a notebook um, and just wrote in my 100 words a minute shorthand, which I learned at journalism school, um, and would record what people were saying. Now you would uh, be able to do it, um, you know, clearly on your smartphone and just record it and transcribe it um, uh, and translate it um, <laughs> as well. Um, uh, you would um, also obviously uh, use... Um, uh, photography, um, you would record it. Um, there are so many other ways of telling that story, probably in a far more powerful way than you can just via text. So it would be that kind of multimedia format that you would use. And uh, um, what skills did you need to learn or would you advise someone to learn that wants to be an editor after being a reporter? What are the kind of uh, missing parts of the chains that uh, you need to fill up? It's uh, so a good question. Um, I think um, as a reporter, uh, you uh, just want to report the story and to write it and send it off. Um, as an editor, you realize that you're actually one cog in a very big machine um, and that uh, you have to learn a lot more co collaborative skills. Um, uh, when the, the process of getting an article uh, back in the day from a reporter filing it to appearing in a newspaper or on the site is quite an involved process. It involves a lot of people, you know, different uh, photography editors or sub-editors or headline writers or uh, the printers themselves um, who have to meet deadlines. So you realize that there's a whole process uh, that you have to be involved in. And as an editor, you're in charge of that process. You're not just in charge of writing a story. Um, what would be your best advice as an innovation editor here uh, for people that are looking at technologies but also are um, are seeing the difficult side uh, of innovations, especially when it comes to attention, when it when it comes also to mental health? Um, do, do you report on these uh, and uh, do you have any advice and things that you have seen? I think it's an incredibly important area. Um, and, you know, I'm, I look at um, my son, who's 21, and the way that he grew up with all this technology uh, and see how different that was from uh, my education and how I grew up. I think there's both a good and a bad side to it. I mean, I remember um, when I was a kid, I would get fantastically bored. Um, and... Uh, you know, in the summer holidays would drag on, even though you're on holiday, or, you know, you'll be in school and be fantastically bored. Um, 
I think uh, the technology that we have now is quite hard to be bored. Um, you know, you have access to a phenomenal amount of kind of entertainment or games or uh, whatever, just information, um, books, um, films, whatever, uh, in a way that we simply didn't. So that, I think, is an incredibly enriching experience. Um, uh, but there is also virtue in having time to be bored uh, because it means that you are you switch off, uh, you do think more, you reflect more. Um, and so uh, it sounds rather perverse, this, but I would say uh, find space to be bored, um, to go for a walk, um, just switch off all your machines um, and find time to, to think things through um, and not uh, to be kind of constantly stimulated by uh, other people who are trying to grab your attention. Um, any technologies or things that you've seen that are uh, helping us to do this, like um, something that um, maybe are, is not so pop uh, at the moment, but you have seen that maybe is helping people to switch off? Uh, I think they're called books. <laughs> uh, kind of <laughs> physical books. Uh, I mean, the ability to lose yourself in someone else's world, I think, is just an incredibly precious um, activity. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I, I read a lot of books on uh, Kindle, um, but uh, it doesn't quite replicate the experience, for me at least, of picking up a book and sitting down and concentrating on it for an hour or two and reading. Um, and I think immersing yourself in someone else's world Uh, can also kind of take you out of yourself um, and give you more perspective on your own life as well. Younger people that want to go into journalism today, what is your best piece of advice for them, besides curiosity, of course, that we talked about before? Persistence. You just have to keep on knocking on a lot of doors uh, to get an opportunity. Um, I mean, I remember back in the day when I was applying, um, I would write letters <laughs> and people would reply to them back in those days. Uh, and you would, for no particular reason, get rejected by one organization. You get a job with another. Uh, you just have to keep um, finding your opportunity. Um, and then once you get your opportunity, you have to seize it. Um, but uh, I think it's a hard profession to get into. Um, but once you have done so, then you are on a level playing field with everyone else. I mean, particularly in the modern world and given the technologies that people can use to build their... Our own personal brands, they don't just have to do it through an institution. So do you um, uh, believe in these uh, um, external brands, personal brands, then that do come along in terms of like maybe reporting and uh, doing uh, that job even without being part of an institution? Or do you need sometimes or like sometimes soon that institutional little stamp for sure i mean there are some i think kind of brilliant journalists who have done it completely by themselves who i admire phenomenally uh but it, no doubt it's easier to do it via an institution that will give you that initial platform on which you can then build your uh, personal reputation and brand um and you know you can move around institutions not that i have done uh, uh in order to kind of get other experiences and perspectives um which can also be very useful for different forms of journalism In terms of skills, what would you recommend the younger um, I would allow to be a journalist to uh, develop? It's interesting. I was on a, a judging panel for the Student Journalism Awards um, a few years ago, and I was quite depressed in a way by how many young journalists wanted to become columnists. They wanted to get their opinion out. Um, and... What I really admired uh, was the relatively few journalists who wanted to be reporters. They wanted to go out and find things that other people were trying to suppress. Um, and I think it's that real determination to get to the truth of things um, that is incredibly important. And uh, I would suggest young journalists um, try to pursue And as an innovation editor, you're not mentioning the technology side. It's because you believe that editorial needs to be working hands in hands with technologies. I'm thinking about data analysts, engineers. Or do you think that the future journalist should have a bit of that scientific background as well? Sure. I, I think it's enormously helpful to um, certainly know how to use all of these technological tools and um, And to understand how they work. So, yes, uh, you know, I mean, I think um, 
Um, most journalists at the FT have traditionally come from kind of liberal arts backgrounds, including me. Uh, some of our very best journalists I, I know who come have scientific backgrounds um, and understand the technology uh, far better than I do. Um, I tend to write more about the kind of impact of technology, but to write about the technology itself, I think it's massively helpful to have a technology background. I have one last question for you, but it's a bit more on your personal side. You've been traveling all over the world, and if there is one thing that uh, our generation, a younger generation, for example, like myself as an immigrant, um, we always feel that lack of roots sometimes, you know, when you're moving around. And have you ever reflected on this? And uh, where, where do you feel home? And uh, when you were younger, what was your approach to that independency? But at the same time, you were saying before, as a reporter, you are out there by yourself. You are not in uh, the editor and the news desk. It's a very, very different kind of life. And you have had that for a very long time. Did you think about that? And how did you approach this? So great questions. Um, one, uh, I, I guess my home is London. Uh, you know, if I had to say where I felt most comfortable and most familiar, it would be London, uh, where I've spent most of my life. Um, but uh, that said, I have loved all the time that I have spent outside London, <laughs> uh, traveling the world. Um, and I think it's um, the ability to see uh, your own world from the outside, as it were, uh, that is enormously valuable and incredibly interesting. And, you know, just in the same way as reading a book can take you out of yourself um, and give you new perspectives on life. You know, going to uh, a remote town in China and seeing how people live and gives you a completely different sense of how the world operates and what is important. Uh, so, yes, I think uh, travel can be an extraordinarily enriching uh, experience in its own right, but is particularly useful if you're trying to write about and interpret what's going on in the world. Thank you so much, John. This was fantastic. We're going to come back now with our question time because we got Shreya and Ali to ask you some questions. So, Shreya, over to you. Um, hi, my name is Shreya. I'm doing my master's at LSC in media and communications, and I also have a keen interest in financial markets. Um, as I look forward to um, invest in my own portfolio, I was wondering, as the innovation editor at the Financial Times and the founder of Sifted, you're, uh, you have a profound understanding of the European startup landscape. What trends or developments do you see shaping the future of European startups, and how can entrepreneurs best position themselves to thrive in this landscape? Well, first thing to say, as a financial journalist, I'm not qualified, nor would I want to give any financial advice to anyone. Um, uh, but uh, I think um, just looking at the European tech scene, it is incredibly exciting what is going on right across Europe. Um, you know, I mean, the studies show that there are now kind of more than 100 um, cities in Europe that have created tech companies valued at more than a billion dollars or unicorns. So pretty much everywhere in you can go in Europe. Now you can find interesting startups. Um, uh, and I think clearly the the subject of the moment is uh, generative AI and how companies are using that to do business in a very different way. So uh, that's definitely a, an area worth looking at. But I think just right across the field, whether it's kind of health tech or clean tech or deep tech or... Um, whatever, ed tech, it, fintech, there are so many different areas in which um, startups are creating value and doing business in a different way, which will be amazing investment opportunities. Thank you, Shreya. Ali, over to you. How are you doing today? Very good. Hi, thank you for having me on. My name is Ali Pasha Dehgun. I'm a second year Uh, I'm a second year student at the LSE reading philosophy, logic and scientific method. I'll also be a summer analyst this year within infrastructure private equity. So I'm very interested in the energy transition and everything that follows from that. Over at the LSE, I'm heavily involved within the business and investment uh, group. Uh, it's a privilege that I'm the head of the LSE M&A group and I'm very happy to talk to you. So my question for you today is, considering the ongoing generative AR gold rush that you just mentioned in both your recent articles and just right now, Uh, how do you see the balance of power between these big tech firms and these specialized uh, startup AI firms within the near future? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And I don't think anyone really knows the answer to it today. Um, I'd sketch it out as far as I can in that I think there are three groups of people who are likely to win. It's not going to be a winner-takes-all market. It's probably a few people who are going to win most kind of market. Um, 
the clear winners, I think, are uh, the people who provide the picks and shovels in gold rushes. Um, and that's going to be people like NVIDIA. Uh, we've seen their share price rocket. Um, they design a lot of the specialist chips that are used for artificial intelligence companies, in particular the kind of graphics processing units. Um, so they are going to do extraordinarily well and are doing extraordinarily well from that. Um, you're then seeing the big tech companies that uh, have developed a lot of these models and the Googles and the Microsofts, um, I think, um, uh, are clearly going to benefit from this whole move towards uh, AI and the way that it's embedded in every aspect of the economy. Uh, but I think there is an enormous space for startups um, to uh, operate in this world. Um, and in particular, uh, it's going to be, be people who use kind of open source models uh, with very domain specific uh, purposes uh, and proprietary data sets. If you can get that combination, uh, I think you can create an incredibly interesting and powerful business. Um, so. I think there can be many different types of people who win this. I don't think it's just going to be one company that dominates everything. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys, for joining us today. And of course, thank you so much, John, for being an amazing guest for our podcast. Of course, just check out what we have mentioned, all the different uh, coverage and products that John is uh, um, working on. Sifted is something that, of course, we have been linking so much on the FT Talent the social media. But you should check a bit more Tectonic, that is a podcast that uh, is uh, talking about all these amazing uh, uh, topics that we tried to cover very briefly today. So just check out for a bit of a deeper understanding on the world of technology and innovation. Again, thank you so much, John, for joining us. Thank you, us. Virginia. Thank you, guys. This has been The Talent Show, which is produced by the FT Talent team, Aya Al-Shihabi, and me, Virginia Stani. Our podcast producer, editor, and sound engineer is Arturo Ochoa, and our social media producer is Letizia Clementi. Our music is by Dennis Kishuk. Check out all of the Talent Show episodes at fttalent.ft.com, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and follow FT Talent on socials for updates. Until next time, and keep listening. Keep listening.